Good afternoon, happy Monday, and welcome to our session on embodied carbon certifications and commitments, a deeper dive. On behalf of the Boston Society of Architecture, thank you for joining the ninth session of Embodying Carbon 101 and BSA's 12 part program series taking place this summer. Today and the next two Mondays, the series will continue to bring you embodied carbon programming with foundational knowledge, tools, and takeaways. All sessions will be available for additional viewing on the BSA website. My name is Sunny Dillard. I am an associate and sustainability leader at HMFH Architects, the Cambridge, Massachusetts based architecture firm. I am pleased today to be joined by Gwen Fuertes, an associate at Letty Nadam Stacy Architects, a 30 person mission driven architecture firm in San Francisco, and co chair of the AIA National 2030 Working Group. Haley Gardner, a senior specialist in energy in energy and carbon at the International Living Futures Institute, a Seattle-based nonprofit with a mission to lead the transformation toward a civilization that is socially just, culturally rich, and ecologically restorative. ILFI is most known for administering the Living Building Challenge, a holistic and rigorous certification program that recognizes regenerative building projects. ILFI also administers zero energy and zero carbon programs, which aim to drive change toward a future with a renewably powered, fully decarbonized built environment. Michael Grinick, an associate and practicing structural engineer at Lemeasure, where he has worked on a number of large projects in and around the city of Boston. He also leads the firm's sustainability practice group. Michael serves as the chair of the Structural Engineering Institute's SE 2050 commitment program, currently under development with a planned launch this November. And David Solomon, Architectural designer and passive house specialist at Revision Architecture. Revision specializes in high performance residential and commercial projects. They also provide sustainability consulting services to other architects, engineers, and developers to help them achieve their high performance goals. Revision is a lead proven provider and has also designed and consulted on many passive house, living build, building challenge, well, and sites projects. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors for this series. Art Woods and Services, Goody Clancy, Huber Engineered Woods, Kingspan, Nordic Structures, Select Building Products, and Thoughtforms. We're grateful for your support. And thanks also to our partners, Building Environment Plus, the International Living Future Institute, and the Structural Engineering Institute. I'd also like to recognize that this program series is supported by the Carbon Leadership Forum and its local knowledge community, CLF Boston, which we invite you to join if you're interested. A couple of notes about this program. One HSU learning unit is available for those who are eligible. We'll share a link to a Google form in the chat box. If you want continuing education credit, please add your name, email address, and the AIA number. If you're not an AIA member but want a certificate, please enter your name and email address. We're recording this session and it will be posted to the BSA website, architects.org, later this week for your access. We ask that you share any questions using the Q&A function. While we might not be able to address them today, we'll use them to inform future programming. Uh, before I hand it over to our first speaker, I'd like to note that you'll see a strong theme in all of these presentations about how certifications and commitments weave into the culture of this community, both through the BSA and individual firms. It's important to remember that none of this happens without people like you, and we're all working on this together. Sharing information, successes and failures across projects and within the larger architectural community is incredibly important. With that, let's begin. Okay, um, I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, my name is Gwen Fuertes. I um, am an associate at Letty Madam Stacy Architects in San Francisco. Today I'm sitting in my home in Oakland, California. And I just wanted to quickly thank um, you all at BSA for hosting me and um, kind of letting us talk about the 2030 commitment um, from the other side of the continent. And um, you've had a really great run. The series has been a fantastic um, series about embodied carbon. And um, I'm really excited to talk about how the 2030 commitment kind of ties into embodied carbon um, 
if you're familiar with the 2030 commitment, you probably know that it's been focusing for the most part on operational carbon, but um, we're really excited to evolve and, and open it up to embodied carbon as we shape um, culture change at our firms. Um, so to just give you a little bit of a background if you're not familiar with the 2030 commitment. Um, this was an article published in 2003 in, Met in Metropolis Magazine, Ed Masria, um, published for the first time, I believe, um, the, the fact that buildings are responsible for over 40% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. And this is really an eye opener um, to the whole industry about the role of architects and how we kind of um, make decisions that really influence this and we have a role to play in climate change and um architecture 2030 i should mention is um is the the author of this graphic and they created this 2030 challenge right so we have a role to play we need to reduce our carbon in our buildings and so they created this kind of stepped reduction to 2030 to get to carbon neutral buildings um, and this is really thinking about operational energy, operational carbon, um, and reducing fossil fuel energy consumption from, um, as, as time passes, from a, it started with 50% reduction actually to 60, 70%. Now I'm updating this graphic to say today is 2020. We're at 80% reduction right now, um, which is, a, is very, very actually um, aggressive to, to try to reduce our fossil fuel energy consumption 80% right now um, to be sure that we can get to carbon neutral by 2030. So this is kind of the, the, um, the overview of the program from the architecture 2030 perspective. And um, I wanted to be clear in this presentation that there is kind of a distinction between architecture 2030 and what I'm re representing as the co-chair of the 2030 commitment with AIA. So the AIA really looked to the 2030 challenge as a, um, a starting point for how maybe how firms can sign on to actually, you know, commit to this 2030 commitment, um, this 2030 challenge rather. So um, the AIA basically adopted this framework and at this point over 800 firms have signed on, which is fantastic. And some of you on the call may be signatories to the commitment, um, which is fantastic. We have a lot of good um, Boston and Northeast representation for sure. Um, so, you know, I wanted to kind of outline what the 2030 commitment framework is. As I said, it kind of adopts the 2030 targets, but how does it actually get implemented? What does it mean to become a 2030 signatory firm? Um, what does it mean to kind of adopt this challenge at a firm? So there's kind of four main points. Um, if you're not familiar with the challenge that I'll just quickly go through. So the first is to sign on as a firm. So the firm leadership, um, you know, recognizes that this is something that is important to their firm. So they sign a letter of commitment to the AIA saying, I am a 2030 signatory. We are on board with this as um, part of our, our firm identity and our firm mission. The second step um, is to make a plan. So create a sustainability action plan for your firm, which is kind of a, a resource for you to basically think, rethink the way that you design to make sure that you're adopting the 2030 challenge as part of the design process. Um, tracking your data is another big piece of this. So you, you're expected to track all of your project's data. So every project in design in your whole portfolio at your firm, um, you're expected to understand what your your firm is doing in terms of the performance of all of these projects. So you have a tool, there's a free tool available um, to track that data. And it's again, for now, it's been operational energy, but we're, we're gonna talk about embodied carbon in a little bit. Um, but the idea is that you can start to track your data so that you know where you need to move and, and how far you are from achieving that challenge. And then finally, the last piece is after you've tracked data over the course of the year. Um, you're expected to kind of submit that and report that to the AIA anonymously. It's all kind of aggregated. Um, none of the data is, um, you know, published to be identifying your firm necessarily, unless you're, a, you're an outstanding firm and you've, you've achieved the challenge. Of course, we would reach out to you if that was the case. But, you know, generally speaking, you want to submit that data to the AIA so that the AIA then has the information how the industry is doing to get towards closer to that target. Um, so I, just to give you a snapshot of what 2030 reporting looks like, and again, I promise we'll get into embodied carbon in a little bit, but 
this is basically the interface of the existing, what we call the design data exchange, that website where we use to track your data. And you're expected to use this as a tool on an ongoing basis across your firm, um, putting in general project information, your project name, zip code, square foot. Um, if you have an energy model, what the energy use intensity, EUI is, um, whether there's renewables and you can put in that information there. So again, historically all kind of focused on operational energy metrics and aligning that with the 2030 challenge from the architecture 2030. And um, the AIA, as I said, once the data is reported, um, the AIA will kind of aggregate and produce a report. This is a screenshot from one of the, the most recent reports available right now, um, showing kind of industry-wide, here is how we're doing. So this is across all of the firms that are signatories reporting their data, what the percent reduction is actually getting to on average across the industry. And so as you can see, um, you know, if we wanted to get to 60%, 70% reduction from that target, we're really not getting as close as we'd like. So this is becoming um, an issue that we need to we need to look closer at. Um, why are we not getting so close to the target as we'd like to? How do we kind of um, elevate the performance and how do we really rethink like what fossil fuel reduction means? Um, and maybe is EUI the right the right metric for that? So that's another conversation we can get into later. But um, this is another just snapshot of how our firm is doing at uh, Letty Maidem Stacy. So we've been tracking our data because we've been involved with the program um, since 2011. So every, pro every dot on this chart represents a project that we've worked on over the course of the year. And so you can see the spread, you know, while we have a lot of, a handful of um, net zero projects achieving 100% reduction, which we're really happy about, you know, we do have an, a handful of projects that are below that curve. So this is another way of kind of just making it transparent to ourselves, to the firm, how are we doing and as, as a signatory to the commitment, are we actually getting to where we need to be? Um, now I'd like to kind of talk about embodied carbon and how this fits into the 2030 commitment now. So um, you might have seen this, this is a, a call to action of sorts from again, tw architecture 2030, where they are rolling out the 2030 challenge for embodied carbon now for buildings, infrastructure, and materials. So reducing embodied carbon emissions to um, zero embodied carbon emissions by 2050, but kind of looking at 2030 as a 50% reduction milestone. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a new challenge to, to the industry a little bit. Um, and it raises a lot of questions. Um, so for us at the, at, on the AIA National um, 2030 Commitment Working Group, we were, we're looking at this and thinking a little bit like, how can we incorporate this new challenge, embodied carbon into the program? Our signatory firms, you know, ready to take this step. And so, you know, the questions that come up for us is like, okay, 50% reduction by 2030, that's, that's a really strong statement, but we wanna know more, what is the baseline that we're reducing it from? Um, we've done a lot of work to figure that out for operational energy, but there's a lot of open questions still for, for embodied energy and embodied carbon. Um, what should we expect from firms that are signed on to the 2030 commitment that are that have changed their culture to really know about EUI, to report their data about um, operational carbon, to really think about energy modeling as like a standard um, practice in their firms? Are we ready to expect firms to do, you know, whole building LCA on all of their projects at in their portfolio? You know, is this is this something that we're ready to ask? But at the end of the day, you know, we all understand that embodied carbon reduction is super, super urgent. So we need to start learning more, even if we may not have these answers quite yet. So I wanted to quickly preview um, what the tool will be looking like. We're really excited about this. So while we may not have um, our base, a reduction from a baseline sorted out quite yet, we do have a tool that can allow you to start just tracking whatever studies that you're doing um, in the new tool. So this is a, a screenshot from a tool that will be launched um, later this year, I believe in October, that is a, a 
a reiteration of the DDX, the Design Data Exchange tool that I showed you a screenshot of earlier. So this is now the new component of that tool that really focuses on embodied carbon. And so you're, um, if you do have projects that are looking at embodied carbon, there's now a way in this tool to also track that alongside the operational energy use in the EUI data that um, we've already been tracking before. So this is a really exciting um, improvement and enhancement to the tool. You can kind of um, throw in your predicted embodied carbon, what tool you're using, the version of the tool, um, what scope was included. So as you know, you, you may not have a whole building LCA ready um, to report an, an SD or, you know, earlier, but you can kind of say what what scope you were including in that study, what LCA stages were included in the tool, and whether or not biogenic carbon is included. So this is really exciting. It's not, um, you know, again, we don't have a baseline percent reduction um, sort of figured out yet, but it is a really helpful way for you at your firm to start, you know, tracking this across the projects that are looking at embodied carbon. And this is kind of the thing that I wanted to bring up with this group. And I'm, I'd love some conversation maybe at the end of the of this presentation about how this really relates to culture change and how we think about communicating about embodied carbon alongside as a high priority next to operational carbon. And this is just a screenshot of some of the um, graphics that we've made at our firm to really think about operational carbon. Um, we have like little pinup spaces when we're in the office, of course, not during COVID times, but um, looking at for every project we're expected to have kind of a snapshot, like how we're doing on EUI, how we're doing, how much of lex or how much energy is electric energy, what our baseline is, just to get a snapshot of like how our operational carbon and where our targets are, are, are at in the design. What I'd love to really think about is what this looks like for embodied carbon and how we can actually use um, this new kind of transition and evolution in the 2030 commitment program to really highlight the importance of embodied carbon. Um, so with that, I'd love to kind of hand it off to Michael, who will also talk a little bit more about commitments um, with structural engineers and how that will shift um, the conversation about embodied carbon with that group. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, thank you, Gwen. Really, really, uh, that was really good stuff, and it's going to make my presentation a lot easier because we're trying, we're trying to, in the structural engineering world, uh, basically mimic what the AIA, what our AIA uh, colleagues have done uh, for operational energy, uh, but specific to uh, structural engineering and structural engineering. Uh, systems. So uh, my name is uh, Mike. I'm a practicing structural engineer at La Measure in Boston, and I'm also the chair of the SU 2050 uh, commitment, which is being developed by the Structural Engineering Institute, which is under the umbrella of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Hey, Mike, will you go uh, presentation view so we can see it larger? Oh, I'm sorry. You don't. Oh, we were just seeing uh, the presenter view. Sorry about that. How about now? Is that better? I think you have to take it off this interview. Sorry. How about now? Um, oh, man. We worked this all out perfectly. I know. <laughs> Hold on. Everyone get really excited. Mike's going to talk about something. I know. Awesome. I'm very excited to present. Excited. <laughs> All right, hold on. Now it's got to be working. You're good. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was in a. I was going to try to break the record for the fastest presentation, but that that just got blown. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> So as Gwen was, uh, had talked about uh, the great work that, that they're doing over there in the AIA world uh, on the operational side, uh, we're sort of setting up a program that mimics that, uh, where we are going to track uh, embodied carbon specific to structural engineering systems uh, with the hope that we're going to establish the much needed benchmarks and baselines for different structural systems over time 
and then uh, a set what we would call reasonable or achievable but aggressive uh, embodied carbon targets, reduction targets over time to ultimately get to zero. Um, there's a lot on the screen, but really this is the same slide that Gwen showed where uh, Architecture 2030 issued the challenge and then the AIA adopted the challenge and developed the program. So uh, on our end, uh, the Carbon Leadership Forum issued the 2050 challenge at the end of uh, last year, uh, which basically said because of the urgency and the, and the latest UN uh, science, climate, science, climate uh, science saying that we have to get to zero by 2050, so the, the actual challenge is all structural engineers shall understand, reduce, and ultimately uh, reduce the embodied carbon in the structural systems by 2050. And so after, um, this is sort of analogous to the beginnings of the AIA 2030 commitment, that's where we are at right now. And through a number of different, um, you know, strategy sessions and, and convincing webinars and, and all sorts of uh, stuff, we finally got the SCI, the Structural Engineering Institute, Board of Governors to give their, their uh, unanimous support for the challenge. And so uh, right now we are on a path to developing the program. And I, I just want to take a quick level set here to talk about, um, I think it's, it's becoming fairly well understood, the importance of embodied carbon. But when it comes to structural engineering systems, um, if, you, if you look at this plot, which is the CO2 emissions for the entire sec, uh, building sector, uh, or, excuse me, in all sectors, uh, what you see here is basically one quarter of all CO2 emissions um, annually are the result of primarily structural materials, okay? And these are structural materials that have been around for many, 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 many years. So what, when we're in a position to sort of say, well, we've got to get to zero, right? We've been using steel and concrete for 200 years, but we've got to get to zero by 2050 in a few decades. Um, it sort of creates a, a situation where uh, if you look at this, what I would call um, a highly scientific plot, a uh, highly accurate plot, two scale plot of uh, embodied carbon sort of um, uh, uh, recognition uh, versus, versus time. You can see this, what's happening right now in the profession is because there's been so much focus on operational energy and, and rightfully so. And there's a, there's a significant amount of understanding and, and push to reduce the operational energy Right now, the scientists are saying, well, no, 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 we have to be completely carbon neutral. So now everyone is now all of a sudden uh, in the last few years really, really focused on embodied carbon. And so I, I think of it as this, this incredible, almost like a nonlinear uh, push for, for um, you know, reducing embodied carbon. It kind of creates a little bit of a gap. So the, the, the plot I'm showing, plot A, is really just that there's a rapidly increasing amount of enthusiasm around embodied carbon. Uh, there's there's this, the understanding of why we have to reduce embodied carbon is extremely high all of a sudden. And they're looking to the structural engineers to say, well, you need to design and specify zero embodied carbon systems really soon. And then you've got the other side of the argument, or, or sort of the, the other plot. And this is kind of like where the structural engineers are I don't want to throw the structural engineers under the bus, but let's just say this is where the structural engineers are, where we're all of a sudden back saying, well, wait a minute, what is embodied carbon? <laughs> how do I reduce it? You're telling me you've got to get to zero. Uh, I don't even know how much embodied carbon is in my system today. Is, and, and, you know, is it even possible to get to zero? And so, so those are questions that all of a sudden we're starting to ask ourselves. Um, and then there's, there's, when it comes to structural engineering, I, I just want to say there's a thing called standard of care. And, uh, you know, the, the structural engineer's number one job is life safety. And so when we get into structural engineering systems that are now being specified differently, the types of materials we're using is slightly different and things are changing, uh, we sort of have to address that as, as, uh, as a group, as a profession, because it's very difficult in our world to go, you know, having a couple of structural engineering firms sort of designing something that's not really with the standard of care of the profession and it becomes a bit of a challenge if, if anything goes wrong. And the only reason I threw Galileo in on this plot is uh, to emphasize the fact that we've been, you know, the mechanics that we use today and the materials that we use today have been around for many, 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 many years. And so now we're sort of in a, in a position where we have to start specifying different materials, better materials, and, and, and so, and, and, and given the, the sort of elephant in the room of the time and 2050, we have to do it very quickly. So we have to, we have to bridge the gap. So again, the developing SC 2050 program is really broken down into three components. Um, I 
call it plan, implement, and share. Okay, so it's somewhat similar to the 2030 um, commitment. The plan being we have to ask our firms to create an embodied carbon action plan where uh, they are going to sort of tell us how they are going to educate their staff or allow their staff to be educated and, and, and understand the global warming potential or the embodied carbon of their structural systems, as well as asking firms to start doing internal tracking and internal accountability. Um, on, on the implementation side, trying to get structural engineers to engage in these sustainability shreds. Right now, the sort of uh, siloed effect is that we're usually asked right at the end, what can you do about embodied carbon? It's much too late to do anything substantial at that point. So moving, moving sort of the design, get the structural engineers involved earlier than they are today, as well as trying to get structural engineers to understand uh, life cycle assessment methods and, and, and trying to understand where um, the hotspots are, the embodied carbon hotspots are in their structural systems and how they can address that. And then finally, uh, sharing is a big one. Um, we need to collect the design data um, from their structural, from the firms uh, about the structural systems. And, um, you know, a lot of structural materials, particularly concrete, are highly region based um, in terms of their impact. So it's very important that we track around uh, different parts of the country. And this is all to say that we're trying to set, uh, establish those baselines or those benchmarks so that people can understand where they are at today so we can ultimately get to the reduction targets. So the program is really set up as a two way street. Okay. I mean, this is, this is kind of how we think about it. We're asking a lot of the profession. We're asking a lot of the profession quickly. Uh, so it's only, we can only do that in good conscience if we are providing them resources and support um, back to make, to make things, uh, to make it possible for them to make the substantive reductions that are, that are needed. These are just some screenshots from our developing website. And so helpful resources, I'll just pick one. For example, we often get asked, well, how does a structural engineer get engaged? Um, or, or how does a structural engineer specify concrete in a, in a more um, or less impactful way? And so what we want to do is provide them some of the tools and some of the sort of, you know, top 10 lists or the, you know, things that we've learned as a, as a group um, and share that. And we want that to keep them to share to, uh, you know, on each project and work on it. And, and um, you know, it's just going to take some time, but we're, we're trying to provide uh, them as many uh, resources as they can. On the quantitative side, this is something that's pretty important to us as structural engineers is we, we're trying to understand real numbers. Okay. Um, and and I'll, maybe I'll just speak personally. I'm getting a little tired of a sustainability consultant telling me I need to hit 500 kilograms uh, of CO2 per square meter without any numbers behind that. And, and that, you know, most engineers aren't going to like that. So uh, three things that we want to provide is the, one of them is the embodied carbon intensity diagrams. Uh, structural engineers uh, sort of have an innate understanding of like the pounds per square foot of steel tonnage in a building, but they really have no idea what the, the embodied carbon intensity would be for that. So we want to provide them some basic um, baselines for typical floor uh, framing schemes. We want to provide them uh, the ECOM estimator, which is just really embodied carbon estimator. We can plug in some basic numbers and get some uh, some rough order of magnitudes in terms of where they think they should be or where they are tracking in terms of the embodied carbon. And then finally, we do want to, uh, as we're tracking this information, we want to provide the profession with those embodied carbon benchmarks for different uh, structural systems. Uh, as I said, a big piece of, of our commitment is the embodied carbon action plan. Uh, I, I won't get too much into this, but this is really the real, you know, this is the, the basis of what firms would be signing up for and, and um, you know, this would be where they would uh, commit to the amount of data they're going to provide, how they're going to get their staff educated, uh, so on and so forth. And this is actually what would be required to be signed by, uh, uh, you know, executive leadership of, of the firm. Uh, and, and this is, there's four, four aspects of it. I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds right now, but uh, just to say that, that this is a big component of the commitment. Uh, another component is we're, we're working on the tracking system. So we have uh, some proposals out for some developers to develop an embodied carbon tracking system uh, where, you know, a lot of it would be available to the public, but people that are specifically signed up to the commitment would maybe have a little bit more uh, access to the data. And so this is really where, you know, the rubber meets the road. And, and this is where we, we really need to understand what is the, what are these numbers that people are throwing out and, um, you know, I'll summarize about two years of research into a sentence to simply say that when there are a lot of parts and pieces of a structure 
And each one of those parts and pieces could have a variety of different material types. And each one of those material types could have a different embodied carbon impact depending on the region of the country or how far you're getting the material from. So th there's, there's an incredibly complex sort of puzzle that we're trying to organize, classify uh, in a way that makes it uh, easy and, and frankly useful for the, um, for the profession. Now, this slide, I'm breaking every rule of, of PowerPoint by putting in as much information as I can in here, but I really just want to say that our goal is to work with the other organizations, like for example, DDX, you know, there have been some conversations about um, sharing embodied carbon data, whether an architect inputs the data or a structural engineer. Uh, and then we also want to partner with our concrete, or excuse me, our, our um, contractor colleagues um, for on the procurement side. And then there's been a whole bunch of um, sort of, uh, you know, efforts or conversations partnering up with organizations like ISTREP-B, which is sort of the um, United Kingdom equivalent of SEI, and we've had some good progress there. So um, I think I'm going to leave it at that and say, uh, like I said, we are planning on launching November, and we really would appreciate people giving us feedback, but also signing up for updates and having your structural engineer send them this link and have them sign up for updates. Uh, we are sending out monthly uh, email blasts for um, the latest and greatest. So I will hand it off now to um, Haley, I believe. Yeah. You're going to have to stop sharing. Okay. I'm having another. <laughs> Thank you very much. No problem. Okay. Are we good to go there? Some nods maybe, yes. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Haley Gardner and I'm the Energy and Carbon Senior Specialist at International Living Future Institute. And um, I know you guys got a, an introduction into the Zero Carbon Program last week, but today I'm gonna be focusing on that and talking about some strategies as well as some case study projects so that you can see what these look like in practice and obviously building on a lot of what um, Mike and Gwen had to say. So at ILFI, we are big on creating a regenerative built environment. And so in this context, that means a world of carbon positive buildings with carbon positive products that are actively reducing the impacts of climate change and having a positive impact on local economies and communities. And even though this might feel like a pie in the sky concept, we really like to think of it as a reality that we can work together to achieve. So to get there, we created the zero carbon certification back in um, spring of 2018, and it's really been evolving since uh, with a lot of growth in the last year or so, um, which makes sense because our programs have a performance period, so it kind of takes about a year for, for pro new programs to get picked up. Um, so we're really proud of this program for a number of reasons, but I just wanted to highlight some of the key leadership elements that we feel create um, you know, these projects are, are really valuable. And so the first one being that they're authentically decarbonized for a comprehensive scope that we'll talk about today with third party verified measured outcomes. They're also resilient projects that are durable, built to last, built with, you know, long lasting pro uh, materials and elements um, that have both economic and environmental benefits to them. They're scalable. So this is the first project program of ILFIs that actively targets scaling up to projects of different sizes. Um, if you're familiar with LBC, you might be aware of some hurdles that teams often face and Zero Carbon really actively works to break down those barriers. And so we've had projects that are, you know, office skyscrapers that are pursuing Zero Carbon certification, which is, is tremendously exciting. Uh, and they're also valuable. They're de-risked to any you know, volatility of carbon markets that might be coming, whether that's a carbon tax or, you know, just fossil fuel industry prices and things like that. Um, so we see those as being, again, really critical elements to our program. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't show an architecture 2030 graph about embodied carbon. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with a lot of these, but um, this one in particular is showing uh, the distribution of embodied to operational carbon over the next 30 years uh, at business as usual. So it's 
projected to be a 50-50 split, but unfortunately I'm cursed with being an optimist. So I think that hopefully operational carbon will even be less impactful as we continue to improve our energy efficiency. Although Gwen, you kind of dampered that optimism uh, with your updates there, but I'm still gonna believe the best. And so anyways, we don't know what this split will look like in the next decade or two. It might be 60-40, it might be 70-30 tilted towards embodied carbon. So we all know that this work is tremendously important um, based on, again, these projections. So when we say zero carbon, um, when we say zero, we mean it. This program looks at both operational and embodied. Uh, and just to run through the requirements so that everybody's on the same playing field today, if you haven't watched last week's yet, uh, there are requirements for operational to improve the energy efficiency of your program of your project without the use of any new combustion systems in your building, and then offsetting that energy with either on or off-site renewable energy. So that is really where the scaling up can happen is because we don't have that on-site barrier as a requirement within zero carbon. And then on the embodied carbon side, it's a similar structure. So reducing in primary materials, so Mike's area there, uh, the heavy structural materials, disclosing your number for your total embodied carbon and the strategies you used, and then offsetting any remaining impacts by purchasing carbon offsets or showing that you used verified um, have verification that any materials you used might have sequestered carbon naturally. So today I'll be focusing, of course, on the embodied side of things and leave the operational to uh, those experts there. Uh, within our guidance, we really see these being the key strategies that teams are using to achieve their reductions in embodied carbon. And in our guidance, we sort of categorize them into three different options here. So working from the highest impact kind of to, to lower impact. Um, there's that cliche of the greenest building is a building that's never built. And there's a reason that's a cliche is because it's true. If you're not using any you know, new materials, then you're obviously reducing your embodied carbon, a one-to-one -one reduction there. So if there's any site assessment you can do to find a building that meets your programming, that's obviously gonna achieve the highest reduction there. Um, but then from there, we go to lean design. So any, you know, if you're using less materials overall in any way that you can really streamline that design. Although Mike, I hear you and the structural engineers, we do not want to sacrifice safety, of course. So just figuring out um, how we can continue those conversations around achieving that lean design as, as streamlined as possible. The next one is materials alternatives. So this is when you're comparing two different materials to achieve the same um, need. So for example, two different types of insulation or two different structural materials, you know, looking at um, the, that one that might have, that ideally has the lowest embodied carbon associated. And then lastly, with the product alternatives, this is when you've set on the material that you're gonna use, but you're looking into the specs for two specific types, um, you know, the recycled content, locally sourced, those types of things. And I just wanna note that for a lot of these, you are likely tracking them if you're pursuing LEED certification, it's just quantifying them a bit more um, and looking at things through more of a carbon lens. And I also wanna point out that this might be in like presented in a hierarchy, but um, there are golden eggs to be discovered in each of these. For example, one of, a project, one of the project teams we're working with looked at their uh, specs of their concrete and they noticed that they could achieve a 10% reduction in their overall embodied carbon just by changing their concrete uh, supplier. So um, there are reductions in each of those categories. Now I wanted to go through some case studies that are in pursuit of zero carbon. Uh, this one, this first one is Catalyst, which is located in Spokane. Uh, it's an institutional university type building with lab space. It's a pretty large scale building. Um, it's beautiful. I've actually had the pleasure of touring it um, when it was in construction. I think it's either wrapping up or just about to wrap up. Uh, but it's a CLT project and they really took advantage of a local supply chain of obviously located in the Pacific Northwest. A lot of sustainable forestry happens out here. So they leveraged that as a resource for their structural elements. And if you're interested in learning more, they actually um, coordinated with CLF and did a whole building LCA of their project to look at the, there's a lot of interesting stuff on you know, biogenic carbon discussions that's really hot button these days. And so if you're looking for a deeper dive, I'd really recommend looking at that LCA. Our first certified zero carbon project, which is really exciting, is a Google office located in London. This was a tenant uh, fit out office space. 
And their carbon story is pretty interesting because when you think of Google, you think of these like very innovative spaces where they can move stuff around and change their programming based on, you know, their teams come and go um, and move around. And so that's how they design their interior space. They have wall panels that they can disassemble and reassemble over 10 times before they have to be disposed of. Um, and so just really focusing on what their programming required led to a really great carbon reduction for their interior spaces because when you think about all the drywall that they avoided and you know carpeting and things like that that might have been needed to move around and disposed of over those renovations or, or you know and change outs of teams are no longer uh, no longer impactful there and they also prioritize healthy materials which certainly helped and then lastly, we have um, 303 Battery, which is a project by Sustainable Living Innovations. It's located here in Seattle, right outside of downtown. It's a 15-story high-rise multifamily project, and it's pursuing both Zero Carbon and the Energy Pedal out of Living Building Challenge, so they are a busy team. Uh, this project had a lot to it, and it's really fascinating, but the high level is that they wanted to rethink the entire construction delivery process by doing prefab. So they assemble all of their paneling um, off-site in a warehouse and then construct it on-site, and this actually results in projects, this project is about 70 to 80% lighter by weight than a typical building, which is remarkable. Um, and they also don't have any concrete above grade because they just highly engineered their they have like an exo, a steel exoskeleton for the project um, and they really considered all of the runs of their piping and cabling and everything is heavily planned out, you know, offsite in the warehouse so that when they go to assemble it, it's, you know, I'm, I'm being very, I'm simplifying it tremendously, but it's like assembling a puzzle. Um, and so again, they didn't do this to reduce their carbon. They did this to build a building quickly and economically. Um, and a really cool fact about this is that they actually have, I think about half of their units are affordable housing, which you guys don't live in Seattle, but um, Gwen can relate being in Northern California. But that is really amazing that they can do that for a new construction project. So um, this is the first of many SLI projects that are really innovative and fascinating. So uh, I would definitely recommend reading in, reading up on their work. So now to give you guys some homework to feel like you have some takeaways from today. Um, like we've talked about, we need data now. Mike, I hear you about being yelled at about the 500 cap, but that's because we don't have the data to refine those numbers. Like my team dreams about a time where we can set, you know, carbon use intensity values for specific project types in specific regions, like we do with EUI, but we're not there yet. So what we need is we need all of you to report it. And Gwen, I'm thrilled that that is being launched soon because we will just shout that from the rooftops to all of our teams to do that because we, we need to get those numbers as soon as possible. Um, and then, of course, setting company-wide reduction targets so that it becomes best practice is certainly goes a very long way. So you don't have to think about it anymore. You know, you don't have to keep comparing concretes, but instead your firm has a matrix or something. Um, and then, of course, applying the strategies that we talked about today to each of your projects. Uh, you're already here, but joining or participating in local Embodied Carbon Knowledge Hubs. CLF has a membership you can join. Um, it's free or you can donate, but they have this community page where people post extremely specific questions so you can you can learn from what everybody else is stuck on as well and participate in those dialogues which is great and then of course validate your success by registering a project with uh, us and and that way we can elevate and um, just help you help celebrate all the work that you did and to leave you with a few resources, we published an embodied carbon guidance document back in December, um, which is a deep dive into achieving our requirements. And then we also published a, in the end of February, a quick guide, which is more of like a checklist, cheat sheet, quick, you know, reference type thing of where your biggest impact areas might be. And then external ones that we really like, uh, of course, Architecture 2030's Carbon Smart Materials Palette website is great. Uh, ULI just published a really awesome business case report which if you need to encourage your leadership to prioritize this, that might be a good place to start. It's really visual, visual, not an extremely technical document. And then lastly, for a more technical deep dive, CLF published a practice guide um, for LCAs of buildings, which is a, a good place to get started. So with that being said, um, thank you so much for your time. And yeah, looking forward to uh, a good Q&A and discussion with all of you.
All right, thank you very much. Um, so I want to um, dive into something that uh, Gwen said earlier, right? And, and she, she mentioned that uh, dealing with embodied carbon is, is, is an imperative. And I want to get into a little bit more of why. Um, historic, this is a historical view of the relationship between embodied and operational carbon. Um, and typically, right, we focused on operational carbon because it's been the much larger uh, percentage of the total carbon footprint. However, let's see, however, my slide is not advancing. Here we go. Um, however, what, we're, what we see happening here, this is a history of the energy code. And what's happening is that uh, typical buildings over time are basically becoming high performance buildings. And so the relationship between embodied and operational carbon is starting to shift along with that. And you'll see that in a high performance building, the amount of embodied, art, uh, embodied energy and therefore embodied carbon makes a much bigger percentage of the overall energy slash carbon footprint of a project. Now, as you already heard, we're going to build about 19 and a half billion square feet per year over the next 30 years. And what that means is that the relationship uh, between embodied and operational carbon is going to shift from uh, 28 to 72% to again about 50 50, right? As we build more and more square footage, uh, and that square footage is more and more efficient. Um, and we're actually using higher embodied materials like more insulation uh, to help us achieve those efficiencies, right? And so what this means is that net zero isn't enough, right? We are not going to be able to add enough solar panels and reduce our um, operational carbon enough to adequately um, uh, uh, to, to, to adequately reduce our overall carbon footprints uh, to combat global climate change. And so what we did is we took a, um, uh, an actual built project and looked at it in several different ways. This is a project by my colleagues, uh, Ilka Cassidy of C2 Architecture and Steve Hessler of Holtzrom uh, Systems. And uh, th this is a large uh, single family passive house located in Pennsylvania. And they came up with a, a, a pretty innovative envelope system or they, they and, uh, and worked with a factory called Blueprint Robotics, which is down in Baltimore in order to prefabricate it. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to really understand what was the embodied carbon relative to the operational carbon of this project and what would happen if we at the same envelope, but just change the overall um, makeup of it, right? So we took uh, basically four other case studies, right? We, we took this exact same envelope, modeled it as a code building. So that was case one. Uh, case two is the exact same code envelope, uh, but we added high performance systems. Case three is a high foam passive house envelope. Case four is what we actually built which is a fairly low foam passive house envelope. And then case five is a foam free envelope. So don't worry about the specifics of the assemblies. Just know that we're dealing with a code building, a code building with high performance systems, a high foam, a low foam, and a foam free envelope. And so what we found uh, when we dove into the results of our, um, of our embodied carbon and operational carbon analyses is that when we compared version one and version two, so same envelope, version two has better performing systems, we were able to reduce our operational carbon by 54%. And when we went from a, uh, from a code compliant envelope to a high performance passive house envelope, right, although one with high foam, uh, we were able to reduce that uh, operational carbon another 31%. However, we actually increased the embodied carbon by 6% because of the additional foam required. 
Now, when we compared that to a low foam passive house envelope, which is what we actually built, we saw a reduction of 35% uh, in, in embodied carbon. So operational carbon stays the same, embodied carbon goes down by reducing the amount of foam. And when we uh, modeled it with a foam-free envelope, we were able to reduce that embodied carbon by a further 15%. So all in all, when we go from a, a high foam passive house envelope to a foam-free passive house envelope, we're able to reduce the embodied carbon by 45%. Now, what we quickly realized was that when we did that, those analyses, we were doing them on a typical 60 year time scale, right? Which is typical for life cycle analysis. However, we don't have 60 years to solve this problem, right? Architecture 2030 has uh, taught us that. And so we redid our analyses on a 12 year time scale. Uh, and what we found, right, was that, again, we go back and look at versions one and two, right, this is code compliant envelope um, with, uh, for versions one and two, version two has high performance systems. The relationship uh, between embodied and operational carbon shifts from 14% and 86% operational to 37%. Uh, embodied and 63% operational. And it's not really too surprising, right? Uh, you know, over 60 years, there's a, going to obviously be a lot more operational uh, energy. Um, and so, you know, this, the, this fit our expectations. However, when we start to look at, um, again, at higher performing uh, buildings, we see that Already, um, our operational carbon uh, and, our, and our embodied carbon shifts pretty radically. And we go from 26% to 56%, right? When we, look, when we start to look at those relationships on a 12 year time scale. And this just underscores again what Architecture 2030 has taught us about that relationship shifting from uh, 28 and 72% to closer to 50-50. So again, when uh, we look at um, uh, the next versions, right, we are seeing that relationship, uh, you know, shift when we go from versions three to versions four. We're looking at that, ver that uh, I'm sorry, version three, right, high phone passive house envelope. Uh, we're seeing that relationship shift from 35% to 66% of the total uh, carbon footprint. And these, uh, these trends hold true for versions four and versions five as well. Um, on versions five, you know, we see a slight dip uh, in the um, embodied carbon because it's foam free, uh, but it still is making up over half of that total uh, carbon footprint for the project. So we have to ask ourselves, right? Where do we intervene in the system, right? Where are the trim tabs? This is uh, this is something that uh, ILFI uh, likes to talk about, right? Where are those points of leverage where we can uh, apply the least amount of effort and have the greatest amount of impact? Well, we know that when we shift production to a factory, we can reduce waste by 10 to 50 percent. And so that was the first thing uh, that we did. Again, this is based on the actual build project. This is a, a photo of the Blueprint Robotics Factory in Baltimore. And these are the wall panels, um, uh, you know, as they're being made. It's a really incredible facility. And another place where we can make a really radical reduction really easily is by replacing foam. Right. So on this project, we replaced almost all of the foam uh, with wood fiber. And you can see here that the amount of um, embodied carbon uh, just in, uh, in foam right, is 21,043.62 kilograms of CO2e relative to the wood fiber insulation, which is actually negative 14,812 kilograms CO2e. And the reason for that is that we're able to take um, uh, 
sequestration credit because the wood fiber uh, is a, um, uh, uh, the wood fiber comes from trees and those trees are sustainably managed. And over the course of um, that tree's life, they've uh, sequestered a significant amount of carbon. And that's, you know, despite accounting for um, the harvesting and manufacture and transportation uh, to, to get that final product onto the building. You can't do that with all wood products. You have to know um, where they're sourced from. Um, but with some of them, uh, you can take sequestration credit. And so that's really exciting, right? Because that really starts to, to shift the needle and push us towards a regenerative architecture. So when we look at the way um, uh, the other parts of this project break down by, by division, right, we see that the other big elephant in the room is, is concrete. Um, if this was a different kind of project, if this was a commercial project, you'd see steel on here, but we don't have much steel in this project. Um, so the other component that we looked at um, was concrete. I'm not going to get into those details right now. Um, but uh, you know, after after replacing the foam, uh, concrete is 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 clearly the next um, uh, the next major area um, for, for for targeted embodied carbon reduction. And so again, I just want to emphasize um, net zero isn't isn't enough if we're serious about um, global climate change and and using our projects as uh, as, as tools to combat global climate change, um, we have to deal with the issue of uh, embodied carbon in addition to operational carbon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to open up the QA really quickly. I think there are still some questions that haven't been answered. Um, let's read through this. Um, Lisa Carey Moore has been putting in a bunch of good ones, and I know that they've been answered already, but I think it might be important for each of the presenters to very quickly, we only have a few minutes left, to just talk about like, how do you convince people that this is important? And I know um, when I first presented this, it said we're all community, we have to do this together, um, but we do have clients and there are other engineers um, could each of you just quickly say how you make the case to either clients, um, other engineers, or people that you're working with? Um, Mike, you want to go first? Sure. Um, and the good thing is I don't have to fix my slides, so it's, I can just speak. <laughs> uh, so, no, I, I actually think... Um, uh, I, I really think it's as simple as uh, I think the structural engineers need to um, like we're we're less we're less the rah rah let's this is important as opposed to we should bring the knowledge of how we can actually do you know uh, like accomplish the reductions that are needed you know I don't know if if our profession's role is to to con try to convince people I think we need to be prepared to respond to their questions I I, I think. Um, I think our profession just needs to be ready and, and engaged. Um, um, I think what we can do is just ask the question on projects. I mean, I, I, I literally like to just ask the question, day one, plant the seed, make it known. We, if we're going to do something, we've got to do it early. Are you talking to a CM? We've got to get the CM on board. Um, and, then, and then most importantly, um, trying to leverage the owners that are really into this, uh, that because you, it's very hard to make any substantive uh, reductions in embodied carbon without getting the, the owner on board because it does simply take, right now what we've seen is it just takes more conversations with the contractors and the designers early. And, and if the owners aren't on board with that, that makes it very hard. I, I Jay, will close with saying that I think there's a lot of organizations out there that are, that are playing the important role of making it known why things are important. Uh, I think it's our job is people on the commitment side to figure out how to make that happen as like sort of boots on the ground and implement, um, implement their, their um, Yeah. You know, I think that's really important that you say that, uh, you did mention something about standard of care. So the more we do it, uh, the more it becomes 
typical and the, the more it becomes built into the practice of standard of care. Um, I know I've had lots of conversations with people about how to convince architects, but we also are other uh, people within the industry, but it also it's, it's the clients and really leveraging the ones that are are ready to, to move forward with this. It's really important. Um, I just, can I just, I just add one quick thing? I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very sorry, but I just think it's really important because there's probably a lot of architects on the, on the call today is, is, you know, the architects have a ton of work to do, right? They're, they're playing point on the whole, you know, they're, they're point person on the entire project, but they need to get into the owner's ear early because oftentimes the owners, um, you know, a lot of them are educated, but a lot of them are just, they just don't understand what it means. And, and is it going to cost something more? And this, and if you just got to really play that role of, of sort of explaining to them and, and sort of walking them through it, um, and then I think that's why your consultants, like the structural engineers, as long as we know a lot about it, we can help you help them. That, that, that's how I see it. Haley, did you want to say something? Yeah, just quickly that one thing that our, a lot of our project teams are having success with is instead of adding carbon as something else to value, you can overlay it on top of a number of other things that your firm is already prioritizing, like streamlined construction, you know, efficient design, low cost. Like there's, I mean, there's a lot of, it's a heavy <laughs> summary, but um, instead of, because we don't want to add another thing to this pie chart that is growing, we want to, it it's really can be woven into your priorities, which we've, we're seeing with our case study projects, like 303 Battery, they weren't like, we're going to have a low carbon building. They just said, how do we get this building up faster? Um, and that was through prefab, which has lower construction waste. And it's just like built into those best practices. So that's what we've been seeing has been successful. Gwen, David, did you want to add anything to that particular question? Yeah, I mean, just quickly, like, I think that there isn't a lot of convincing that needs to happen. Like, the numbers are there. Um, I mean, Haley and David, you showed some really great case studies that are, you know, out there for us to learn from. And, like, so I think that it's it's not like we need to convince with, like, do the research. Like, it's pretty much there. It's, it's for me, I don't know, talking to clients is one thing, but talking to other architects um, and making them see that this is important. I think that they're in our commitment. Again, we have 800 firms that are signed on. A lot of them are large firms, but how do we get, you know, the small and medium sized firms to understand that this is important, that they can do this, that this is something that should be integrated in design. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a true power to having kind of a structured commitment in place to like make you start tracking and start to understand and build that literacy across the firm. So um, I'm, it's kind of my, my mission is to kind of make sure that the small and medium sized firms are um, empowered to start making those decisions, start talking to clients, bringing up those questions and like partnering with structural engineers that have those values in mind. And I'm also really excited to bother my structural engineers to make sure that they're signed on to the commitment because it's finally a way that I can start like making them, um, you know, responsible and co partner in, in this mission because we're all kind of going towards the same North Star here. So, um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. I do want to build on that just a little bit because there was another question about benchmarks and I think that's often something that comes up too. Like, how do we figure out where, where we're starting? How do we get better? And I think almost every one of you spoke on this. We need data. We need people to be involved. We need people to upload their projects. Uh, both with the RLFI and the 2030 commitment and even um, on the SC 2050 stuff, I think um, that is really important. And although we do want to get better, we have to figure out where we're at first to do that. Um, maybe let's look at a few more questions. I think most of them have been answered. Um, any sort of closing words that anyone wants to add to that before we say goodbye to everyone? I would just say, I just want to make one comment about the 500 kilograms per meter, per meter squared is just to say that uh, uh, that I'm very glad that Haley brought that up because that is the current state of the art right now. And, and that just underscores the need to collaborate and share and share that information. So I, yeah. I, and look, we don't like throwing that number at people. Like I wish that I could say it's 500 broken down like this, but we can't do that. We just had to throw in like at ILFI, our favorite game is to just throw requirements and be like, how does this sound? And then we see where that bar is. And if we have to raise it, which we normally, we just like to keep raising it. Um, and so we want to make that like a more reflective number, which again, we rely on people like you to report that to us. And so, yeah. 
I understood. <laughs> All right. <laughs> awesome. Um, any of the questions that we get to, um, stay tuned. We're going to be developing more program, and hopefully we'll get into more depth about every question that you have. Um, I'm going to share my screen really quickly for a few closing remarks. Uh, oh, missed this one. Thank you to our speakers, Gwen, Mike, Haley, and David. Um, again, thank you to our sponsors and our partners. Um, and I wanted to remind you, if you haven't done so yet, please enter your name, email address, and AIA number if you want to receive continuing education credits. Um, what's next? Don't forget, there are only two sessions left uh, that remain in the Body and Carbon 101 series. Next week, we'll have a session on making the case, which we sort of talked about at the end here. Um, so join in if you wanted to hear a whole hour's worth of conversation about that, um, or how to speak to emb about embodied carbon to clients and collaborators. So be sure to tune in. We'll, uh, we'll look out uh, for the recording of the session, which we'll share with you uh, later in the week. Thank you again, everybody. Um, have a good week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You all.